Lord and the will of God for our lives. We, we welcome you. And for those who are visiting, we welcome you as well. We, don't, we know that, that you're not here by happenstance, although you, know, you may have been inviting somebody, you might just been flipping or, or whatever the case is, and you found us. But it's not by happenstance. God has a word for you this morning. Uh, we want to just, um, God is good. He, he's, he's just good. Let's, let's lift our Bibles and, and make our confessions. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I'm about to receive the life-changing seed of the Word of God, and my life shall never be the same because I came to believe and where I have need, I came to change, and the devil cannot stop me. By the help of God, I shall believe, I shall receive, and I shall be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are uh, concluding. We are concluding our topic uh, that we have been dis uh, been on, and that is uh, our premarital class. And so we are drawing very near, near to the end. And so again, I wanted to um, admonish us to listen. Uh, we should have been listening to these messages that have gone forth over the past uh, few months, a couple of months, or however long we've been teaching this. Um, and I don't want you to forget all of those messages. As a matter of fact, you need to go back and review all of those messages because, and especially now that we're drawing near to, to the end, you need to go back and recollect all of these things because what I am, what I am teaching now is, is really tying it in. It's bringing it, bringing it all in together, but you won't be able to see this in until you recall and remember everything that you've heard uh, up until this point. So I left off, because I'm not going to review long, but I left off last week with talking about the consequences of being out of season. And so, uh, again, as it relates to a premarital class, there are consequences when you get ahead of God and you do things out of his season. Not that you're doing a wrong thing, but you can be doing a right thing at the wrong time. And so, uh, and that wrong time being when God says it's the it's time. That's that's the right time, not when you think it's time, but when God says that it's time, then that's the right time. And so we know that marriage is honorable. Hebrews in Hebrews chapter thirteen it tells us that marriage is honorable. God wants you to be married. If, you, if that's your desire, He wants it for you, because there is no there is no greater as far as as far as relationships go, as far as, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. As far as relationships go on this earth, there is nothing more honorable than the, the marriage relationship, the covenant relationship of marriage between a wife, a husband and a wife. Again, why is that? Because it's supposed to be a reflection of Christ and the church. And so that is an, it's, it should be evident. It should be a demonstration of Christ, Christ's relationship with the church. So there is no greater relationship than that. So that's why. That's why he says, I need for this. Some people, they need, all of us really, at some points, and we, we, we may have grown um, uh, since then, but at some point in all of our Christian walks, in all of us uh, confessing Christ and, and having faith and, develop and developing and building faith, we've all needed to see a demonstration. We all need to, we needed to see it. We need to see it with our eyes. We need to be able to experience it. And, 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 and the, the scripture tells us that our faith, it comes from by faith to faith. That means faith to faith means that there are experiences that you have that will build your faith. You can see things that will build your faith. And so we all, God created us as those, type, those types of beings. Uh, well, we, well, we need to see. Sometimes, so you have to be able to see because you have to be able to see hurts and people. You have to be and discern and all of that. So God created us as as demonstrators, and there are things that we need to see, and things that that we need to to see in order to be able to produce and and do what it is that whatever God uh, has for us to do. So. 
So that is, is, is know, that, know that it's for you. If you want it, it's for you. So it's not about God, uh, not or people, even people. It's not about your pastor. It's not about the ministers, your teachers. It's not about your parents uh, trying to keep you from it. We're just trying to keep you from the challenge, the extra challenges that come along with marriage when you do things out of God's season and when you're not prepared for marriage and that's what this is all about it's about making sure that you are prepared so the consequences of being out of season remember that we said that that that, that timing is all God's and timing is in our hands I had you to write down um, 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 a note last week to say it is not my in my power it is not in my power to change an appointed time and I wanted you to, to concentrate on that and think on that meditate on that it is not in my power to change an appointed time it is not in any not just in this particular topic or on this particular subject but in life period it is not in our power to change an appointed time it is what God says it is it has already been set it has already been established and all he needs you to do is to follow him follow his lead follow his guide and he will and you do what you're supposed to do in those times as he's guiding you through those seasons and you will be prepared for the next you will be overly prepared for the next season if you would just stay with him and stay where he's guiding and leading you and do your part in the season that you're in so we said that that's the reason why we the reason why we we get out of season the reason why we we take actions outside of what God has commanded or his timing that he has set forth is because uh, um, it's because that we we just get we get dissatisfied. We become dissatisfied. We become discontent with where we are. We are focusing on the season that we're in instead of focusing on the work that needs to be done in that particular season. If we would focus on the work that has to be done in that season, then the season will go by probably quicker, faster than, than what you could imagine. But it's when you're harping on and when you're always thinking about, oh, I'm trying to get to this and oh, I'm trying to get, you know, I just want to be married. I just want to be married. I just want to be married listen you say that you just want to be married but you don't understand the preparation that God is trying to take you through right now it will prepare you and he's already he told us that in the very beginning of, of this particular uh, teaching uh, this this subject he says if you would just do what I've asked you to do what I'm asking you to do right now if you would just do it he says I promise you that you're going to experience the goodness of the land of marriage in, in the marriage covenant he promised that he promised that he promised that and all we have to do is trust that he has our best interests at heart we just have to trust God listen God doesn't want you to be married to, to, to get married to be miserable he don't want you to get married to be miserable because if you're miserable then you're not going to do what the thing that God has commanded the marriage to do and to demonstrate and to be you won't be able to show forth God's goodness and, and, the, and the love and the, the relationship that Christ has with the church if you're miserable. You won't be able to produce a godly seed and raise a godly seed if you're miserable because you're going to be so caught up in your marital uh, 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 conflicts and situations that that child is going to go neglected. God doesn't want you to be miserable. He says, all you have to do, if you would just take heed to my word and do what I'm asking you to do, you will reap. You will reap all this that you're sowing. You're going to reap it. You're going to reap it all that you are sowing, all of this work that you're sowing, all of this work that you're sowing, you're going to reap the benefits of it. You're going to reap the good consequences of obeying and that's what we will we want the good so we talked we were talking about consequences last week and I told you that that consequences it, they're neutral a consequence is neutral all it is it's an effect it's a direct result it's an effect of an action whether good whether bad so you act 
or your d the r direct result or the effect of a bad action will result in, a, in bad consequences. The result, the effect of a good action will result in good consequences. That's just simple. It's just plain and it's simple. It's just a byproduct. It's a byproduct of what you put out there. It's a byproduct. It's a payoff of your actions or your condition. So here, then we started talking about uh, um, uh, the consequences. So some general consequences. So we, we've generalized these things. We said that taking action outside of God's appointed time, A, that means you are out of God's will. That's a consequence that you are out of God's will. We're not going to go there, but we talked about Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13, where Saul was going to battle. And he, uh, although he had, a good, good, had a, a good intention, he wanted to invoke God. He wanted to invoke the favor of God as he was uh, going to battle. As the Philistines started, was pressing on him, he thought he was running out of time. And so he offered something that was not his to offer. Instead of waiting for the prophet Samuel, as God had already instructed, instead of waiting for him to come and to offer for him the offering, he decided, listen, uh, uh, um, Samuel is not here. These Philistines, they're pressing, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming hard for me. And look, I'm just going to go ahead and offer this up. I'm just going to go ahead and invoke God's uh, favor. I'm just going to go ahead... He did exactly what God had not instructed him. He got ahead of God. He got ahead of God. And when he got ahead of God, his actions cost him his kingdom. Listen, good intentions, uh, it, uh, this is what I just said, it's okay. It, it's a wonderful thing to desire to be married. But when you get outside of God's will, Marriage is honorable, but when you get outside of God's will and you decide, you decide when and when it's time and where, and you you just you decide all of it. You decide uh, who to marry, and yes, you do decide. But there is there is some direction, there's some leading, there's some guiding that goes with choosing your mate. But no, you decide on your own. I'm just gonna choose. I'm just going to choose. I'm not taking no counsel. I'm not going to allow him to him or her to, to you know, to, to, to see my pastor, to see any of the ministers. I'm not going to barely, barely, barely let them see my parents. And when they do see them, it's just a high and a bye. You know, not not anything, that, not anything that's going to allow for examination, not anything that's going to allow them to intimately get to know this young man or this young woman. That, that, see, see, and, and those those kinds of things. That that means I want to do it my way. That's what that means. That that's what that means. That means I want to do it my way. I'm gonna get ahead of God instead of instead of instead of waiting for God to show me, for God to direct me. For and again, I. I I'm not saying that that, per that that person is not the right one. I'm not saying that it is, but I'm not saying that it's not. But it could be that God is saying, listen, I need to work on you. I need to work on both of you. But no, you want to rush. You want to push. You want to push the issue. I told you last week, whether you are male or female, it's usually women who do this. Always trying to, because they get, they get so antsy about marriage. They get so they get so antsy about the it's really about the wedding. They get antsy about the wedding. You know, they all want to dress up and they all want to, you know, all eyes on them and they can, you know, have the trains for. Listen, and it's okay if you got the money to do it, do it and do it up. Do it right and just invite me to the wedding. But but just be sure and understand that rushing, getting to that point just because you're you know, again, women. We, our biological clocks are ticking. We love to say that our biological clocks are ticking and I'm not getting any younger. My eggs going to dry up and all, you know, all craziness. But if God, if God can, can produce a child and have, have Sarah and Abraham to produce a child at their age. Now he's not waiting. I'm sure he's not waiting that long for you. But, but if he can, if he can wait and produce in, in them, it's nothing, nothing too hard. You being 30, you being 40, that's nothing. Not when you're talking about a 99-year-old and a 100-year-old. That 30, 40 is nothing. It's nothing. So we, we try to rush and we try to do all of those, those things and we get ourselves into trouble. 
trouble that you do not, marriage already comes with challenges. You don't need any extra challenges because you were not prepared or you did not allow, you were not waiting, and well, that shows that you weren't prepared either. I was going to say that you, you didn't allow for God to prepare that other person and that other man. He's probably working on that other person too, but he's definitely working on you because you're impatient. So that shows right there that there's work to be done in you if you're impatient. So we, we, got to, we need to see and we need to understand those things. So you're, you're out of God's will when you step outside of his will and you get ahead of him, even, if it, even, it's, if, even when it's good intentions behind it, even when it's, it's properly motivated, even when it's properly motivated, it, is, it, is, it, it will lead to your destruction and your demise. Destruction and demise, it can be self destruct it can be a failed marriage, it can be a broken home. It can be misery. Misery is what we talked about. Misery because of the problems that you cause or maybe even marrying the wrong person. And you don't want to go through. And after, again, at the, after the marriage, after that big wedding that you're planning for, you got to be married. It's, it doesn't stop there. You got to live with that person. You got to live with them. From that day forward until you die, you got to live with that person. And they got to live with you. And you have to live with your decision. And they have to live with theirs. Bottom line. Getting outside of God's will and doing things outside of God's timing, you uh, act on your own impulsive desires. And we talked about that last week, acting on your own impulsive desires. And we see how that led, where that led David. So your blessings are delayed or even denied. So A, you're out of God's will, but B, your blessings are delayed or even denied because you act outside of God's will and you act impulsively. I gave you, I told you that that's adolescent behavior. That's like children. So I taught, I gave you uh, the, the illustration um, or the example of a child running out in the street because of their ball. The ball runs out in the street and all they know, impulsive, I need to get my ball. They are not concerned about the cars that are coming. I was thinking about this uh, uh, this week. My grandson, Ezra, he, he does, he does right now, he does whatever it is that he wants. Without, but he hasn't developed he hasn't developed the capacity for consciousness about certain things. He hasn't developed the consciousness. He's not positioned to be able to hear and to have a consciousness of right and wrong. But as a believer, you have been positioned to be able to do that, but you have been granted the capacity to. But you haven't positioned yourself to be mature in Christ, to be mature enough to hear. Remember, we are teaching on Wednesday. Maturity is being able to hear and obey. Maturity is being able to hear and obey. The two go hand in hand. Maturity, that's what maturity is. So adolescent behavior, it means that I'm not hearing Oh, I'm not listening. La, 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 la. That's adolescent behavior. I hear you talking, but I'm not listening. La, 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 la. That is adolescent behavior. That's what children do. And when you fail to hear God, when you, when you fail to position yourself to hear God, you cannot develop a, 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 an ear to hear him and you can't and you will not obey because you can't obey what you don't, what you haven't heard. And I'm not talking about a natural something, a, a natural hearing, just, just the, the sound waves. I'm talking about hearing, I'm talking about receiving, I'm talking about hearing audibly and receiving it in your heart and taking it to heart, taking it in your heart, grasping hold of it, accepting it and embracing it and obeying. That is maturity. That is maturity. And so we act on our own impulsive desires just like King David did. And we see where that led him. It cost him his newborn. He lost his newborn child. He lost control of his children. He had that trouble with his, with his daughter, between his daughter and, and his sons. He had all of that going on. And then finally, optimally, 
he lost the opportunity to build the Lord's temple, which he had a good, he had a desire to do that, a great desire, a wonderful desire to build the temple for, for the Lord. But God said that the blood shed it. And yes, he was a king and they went to war and all of that. But, and although this is not the, that was not the sole reason, so we know what happened with him and Bathsheba. He, he, uh, uh, took, he took her as his wife, another Uriah's uh, wife, and then he sent him to battle, put him on the front line so that he could be killed. That was unnecessary shedding of blood. And I believe that that's part of what God was saying. He says, look, you, you are a man of war. You are a man of blood. Look, and, and, and again, it, I don't think it was necessarily this, that one incident, but that was surely part of it because of the unnecessary blood that he shed, not by his hands directly, but he set him up to be killed. He set him up to be killed. Again, acting out of his own impulsive desires with Bathsheba, and then here we come. There's a trickle, a trickle effect of all these things that he had to do to cover it up. <laughs> All these things he had to do to cover it up. So, so, so we see here that 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 he lost. He he was denied the opportunity to build God a, a temple. And then third, you bring pain and suffering, or see, you bring pain and suffering upon yourself and others. Listen, Abraham and Sarah, they were promised a son. They were promised a son, but they were not content to wait for the promise to come to pass. They had to take things into their own hands. They took things into their own hands. They took the matter in their own hands because they thought that they were running out of time. They thought they were running out of time. Abraham having a child with Hagar, the handmaiden, created hatred and jealousy. It created hatred and jealousy between Hagar and his wife, Sarah. And ultimately, it led to Hagar and Ishmael being sent away, causing even more pain and more suffering. They were sent out, gave them food, gave them some water, and they had to go. Why? Because of the hatred and the jealousy that had taken part between Sarah, his wife, and Hagar. Again, taking things into their own, taking things into their own hands, taking matters into their own hands. So we see that, that you can bring pain and you bring suffering. It will come upon your children. It will come upon your children when you take matters into your own hand. Because again, we talked about, I talked about that earlier, misery misery you bring misery in your marriage when you when you when you uh, marry someone that you're not shouldn't be married to or you marry someone before you were prepared to be married to them you bring misery into that marriage and then you bring misery be, uh, upon those children it's listen it's nothing it's nothing worse it is nothing and i don't care what you say we close behind closed doors i listen it, it ain't no, no such thing, no such thing. Listen, I was a child, I was a child. We, we have all been children before. And children listen at the door. Oh, come on now. Children listen at the door. I've been a child before. You hear something that sounds like raised voices. I'm gonna go to the door and listen. I'm gonna get on the floor and try to listen under the hole so I can hear better. I'm gonna get a glass. So I can put it up to the door. So I, they, and they see, they see the interactions or the non-interaction. They see all of that. And listen, that brings misery because then the, now, now the children, they're blaming themselves for, you know, what's a why? If I, if I, maybe if I was just a better child, they wouldn't be going through. Maybe if I was good, then they wouldn't be having these problems. You know, all, all of those things, they go through that. And then you go through a divorce, you go through a separation. And now you got the children involved. Well, I love my mama. I love my daddy. And now, and now I'm torn because not, they're not together. And I got to wait and see, you know, all, all of that craziness because you simply did not wait on God to prepare you, to prepare him, to prepare her so that you all can live together in unity and in harmony. God says he promised if you would just do this work that you will be able, you will be able to reap the good of the land. And listen, 
I know God sees those. Okay, so let me, I'm going to tell you this right now, right now. The next part of this, and I told you that God has something for you today. This, listen, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. God is telling you, if you are, if you've been talking about marriage, you're in a relationship. You're in a relationship, a romantic relationship. And you have been talking about marriage. You have been considering marriage and you all have been talking about it. You may not have gotten yet to the courting stage. And if you have not gotten to the courting stage, or if you have gotten to the courting stage, this is what God is saying. This is what he's saying as we're wrapping up this premarital class. This is what he's saying. 30 day fast. Not a 30 day fast from food, a 30 day fast from each other. If you have not gotten to the courting stage yet, but you're kind of dating, I'm going to say dating seriously. Uh, and remember, and that's this, again, this is why you need to go back to, to the teachings that, that Minister Hill did on dating. Okay, you can, so you can see those differences. Because a courting stage, that's the stage when you have said, I'm committed to this person. I'm not looking any further. But God says, a 30-day fast, you need to fast from that person. That means no calling. That means no texting. That means no communication, period. And in that 30-day fast, you need to seek God for you. You need to seek God. You, Lord, you said you were preparing me. You got a whole 30 days. Remember I just said, you need to go back and review all of those messages. You got a whole 30 days to do just that. You got a whole 30 days to be in prayer and to, to go over those messages and indulge, not just read over, indulge in those messages. Allow God to minister through you, through your prayer time and that study time, that review time. Allow God to minister to you. 30 days. He says, if you are courting, if you are courting, and at some point, not right now, but at some point you have been physically intimate, at some point you've stopped. But at some point, you have been physically intimate, you need to fast for three months. Three months. If you've been physically intimate at any point during your relationship, you need to fast for three months, not 30 days. That's for somebody who has not had physical contact or physical intimacy. If you've had physical intimacy, if you've had intercourse, if you have had sexual relations, you need to fast for three months. That means no talking. That means no texting. That means no seeing. For three months, and you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing. You're reviewing. You're praying. You're asking God. You're seeking God. You're seeking God for direction. You're, 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 you're seeking him for, for the work that needs to be done in you right now. And lastly, if you are still having sexual relations with a person that you are courting or that you are dating, you need to double that six months. Six months. You need three months. First, you need to stop the sexual activity and you need three months from that time. But then you need another three months to continue on with your review, with your fasting, with your praying. You need that. Six months. If you're still at this point right today or yesterday or last week, anytime, if you, if you have been sexually intimate with that person since, whenever, don't get legal with me. It was only two weeks. It was the last time it was two weeks. So I should be at the point where I've stopped. No. God knows in, in your heart if you were just, you just hadn't had the opportunity in two weeks or not. So don't, don't be legal. Don't play that legal game with God. He says, if you, if you desire, if you truly, if you are a believer and you truly desire to do things God's way, to have what God intends for you to have in your marriage, you, this is not a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. 
He's saying that this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. 30 days. 30 days for those who are, who are seriously dating, who are courting with no and have not had any sexual encounter, no sexual activity at all. Three months if you have had it in the past and six months if you are currently sexually active. Take that for what it's worth. You do it or you don't. It's not up to me. But God, it, that's between you and God. That's between you and God. And listen, if your relationship cannot withstand a fast, ooh, listen, if you cringed, if you cringed when I said that, 30 days, no texting, no communicating, no talking, if you cringed when I said that, that means that work is for you. That's a part of your work. That's a part of your work. If you can't do that for 30 days, you're going to die because you don't talk to him. You're going to die because you can't text her. 30 days. 30 days. If you can't do that for 30 days for your God and to, and to seek his face, that's a sign that you're not mature enough to get married. That's a sign. Tell, tall tale sign that you are not mature enough. You're not stable enough in God. You're not stable enough. You're not committed enough to God. You're not stable, you're not committed enough to God. You're not mature enough in God to be talking about. Marriage should not even be on your lips. Marriage should not even be on your tongue if you cannot do that for 30 days. If you can't do it for three months. If you can't do it for six months. You are not mature enough. And that's, that's why God gave you six months because you haven't been mature this far just to be able to hear him say no sex before marriage. Bam! There it is right there. That's a sign of what? Adolescent behavior. I'm just going to go for what I know. It's, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. And I'm just going to do it. That's a sign of immaturity right there. It is what it is. You make it do what it do. Spiritual. I told you this last concept that we're going to address is the spiritual and natural requirements before marriage. I've divided this into five things. And um, so everything that we're going to talk about from, from, from this point until the end of our time the spiritual and natural requirements before marriage. Five components, and they both they have both a natural requirement and a spiritual requirement. I'm going to give them to you, and then we're going to go back and, and kind of break these down. A, stability. Stability. And we're going to break down the natural piece of that and the spiritual. Stability. B, maturity. Maturity. C, transparency, transparency. D, orderly financial affairs. D is orderly financial affairs. And lastly, E, commitment. A, stability, B, maturity, C, transparency, D, orderly financial affairs, and E, commitment. Let's start with, with letter A. So again, these are spiritual and natural requirements before marriage. And, 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 and I want you to take note, make note that I put spiritual first. Make note of that, that I put spiritual, spiritual and natural requirements of all of these before marriage. A, stability, stability in Christ. Stability, that you are complete in him. Again, we talked about if you are not able to do a fast from that person for 30 days, that means you're not stable in Christ. Stable in him and him alone, not depending on anything or anyone else. You need that in marriage. You need that. Because when challenges come up, 
Spiritual challenges come up and you some somehow you don't seem to 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 see eye to eye with that. You're going to have to be stable, stable in your decision to follow God, stable in your decision to follow Christ. You got to be stable in that. You got to be stable because at a certain point when that woman decides that she's going to in, in her carnal behavior and her and her the lust of her flesh and she decides that she wants to you know spend money that she shouldn't be spending when you've already said that this is what we need to do I've heard from the Lord we gonna downsize we're gonna do this because I heard the word from 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 the Lord that our pastor ministered about getting out of debt and about about saving and all of that and she wants to you know kind of manipulate a little bit you know I, I hear it I'm down with it but this pair of shoes I just can't leave that pair of shoes on the, you know, I bypassed. I did bypass all of those other five, but this one right here, I really, I really need that. You know, when when all of those, you have to be stable in your position. You got to be stable that God has set me as the head of this house. He, if I, if we don't obey, if something happens and we don't, He's not gonna look at her. You, can, I can't call. I can't call her Eve. I can't say well, the woman you gave me. He says no, 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 no. He says I, you have been set as the head of your household. You have been set as the authority in that household. See, that's stability in Christ. You got to be stable enough to hear to be able to hear from God you have to be stable enough to be able to rely on him to him to get you through situations for you have to be stable in him stable in your relationship with God stable in your fellowship with God that's very important you need both you need stability in your relationship and you need stability in your fellowship stability that means I'm able to go to him, that I go to him, I, I, I commune with him daily. I, I got to be stable. That needs to be set. That needs to be firm. Set firm. Stability. And that stability in Christ, that's going to lead to, your stability in Christ is going to lead to your natural stability. It's going to lead to your natural stability because then you're going to have the attitude, that, that faith, that trust, that dependence. Because I'm stable in God, my life is stable. That means that, that nothing, nothing in my life that have no situation that arises in my life, none of that will be able to move me. You know, again, I might sway a little bit, I might, but I'm not going to be uprooted. I'm not going to be upgrounded. I am going to be firm firm because of my relationship with God it's going to bleed over into the natural it's going to bleed over I'm not going to you know if I lose my job today or tomorrow I'm stable in God my reliance and my dependence is totally on him I know I trust him I believe him to take care of me why because of my fellowship my relationship and my fellowship with my God you have to be mature, being able to be in the place, able to handle, able to handle the challenges that arise. Maturity in Christ, the place where you hear from God and obey. Remember your teaching on Wednesday. That's maturity, the place where you can hear from God and obey. You got to be mature mature enough and that maturity in Christ the place where you can hear from God and you can obey God taking his word taking what he says to heart uh, uh, accepting it and, and embracing it that maturity in Christ to hear from God to hear from him and to obey that's going to bleed over into the natural being able to handle challenging situations so you got to be able, listen, when you are in a marriage covenant and you can see that, these, and listen, these are things that, these are things that, 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 that need to be um, already uh, solidified and, and being developed in this time, the premarital time, the time before that, because you can't wait to get these things when, you, when you're married. That's just way too late. As a matter of fact, you're almost too late if you're in a courting and you're in a dating stage. That's, all, that's right there. That's, uh, that's really way too late. You, the, these are the things. So teens, you need to listen. Teens, you need to listen to this because you're in the prime, prime time. You're in prime time. 
primetime TV. When everybody's watching prime time, that's prime time. That's what everybody is watching. So you're in this prime time. Now is the time for you to get this, so that you can already you can you can just you'll be ready to run with it. You'll be ready to run. So you got the and it's not because it's not maturity in Christ is not about age. It is not about age. What do we say? Maturity in Christ is being able to hear from God. You hear a word like this and you obey. That's maturity. And I guarantee you, some of you are more mature than some of these old folks. I guarantee. Tiffany Holland, I guarantee you're probably more mature in Christ than some of these old folks. Tathia Martin, Tathia Martin, you are probably more mature in Christ than some of these old folks. And those are the two that come to mind. If I didn't call your name, don't get offended. Those are the two that come to mind. This is time. This is the time. Maturity in Christ, to be able to hear and to obey. And it's not about age. Let us see transparency with God. And, and Minister, Minister Haston laid that out beautifully. That intimacy. Remember, so, so this is part of courting too. It's a part of courting too. But, but, but we're talking about first intimacy with God. That intimacy with God. God already knows. Yes, he already knows your struggles. He already knows your struggles. He just wants you to come to him and talk about them. What kind of good God is that? Yes, I've laid out all these things that you should not do. I laid out all of these things, but guess what? I am not a God. I am not a Savior that cannot be touched by your infirmities. All I need for you to do is come to me. He says, come to, I just need you to approach me. Just approach the throne of grace. There you can obtain mercy. There you can obtain a little extra help to help you with those struggles. But you got to come to me with them first. You got to be honest with yourself. See, listen, we, 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 try to, we try to play the religious game. And we come to church and we, do, and we come here and we want to act like we got it all together. But when we get home and we, do, when we get away from people, you know, those struggles are real in our lives. But God says, listen, don't, don't, you can play games with people, but you can't play games with me. I need you to talk, open your mouth and talk about it. Open your mouth and talk about it. He says, and I will help you. And again, when you are transparent with God, that will lead, that will bleed over into your transparency in your natural relationship. At the courting stage, what did I say? At the courting stage, there needs to be some intimacy developed there in that regard. Remember what Minister Hayson said, it's not about physical. We're not talking about physical intimacy. That is not what we're talking about. That's a sexual activity. That's not intimacy. That's a sexual, that's a physical activity. Intimacy is not a physical activity. It may touch the heart, but it's not touching no parts of the body. You got that? Intimacy is not touching any part of the body. That's intimacy. So you, you have your intimate with God, that's gonna bleed over into intimacy with the person that you are courting. Again, at the courting stage, remember that's why you gotta go back and listen to the messages. That's the point where you've said, I've stopped looking. I've stopped looking. We're taking our relationship to the next level because we're heading, that courting stage, we're heading down the path of, of marriage. And remember what he talked about in the Old Testament. At that point, at that point, that's when that's when the, the bride, when the when the the the, the, the husband, when the, the groom, he gives the dowry. Remember the dowry that he talked about. So that see that that means I'm betrothed to this person. I'm 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 already starting to lay down my life for this person. I'm showing them, I'm I'm being intimate with them. I'm 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 opening myself up to them. See, that's that that's the that's the time that see now we're betrothed. We're we, we, this is it. We're we're in it. We're in it. We're just starting this, we're starting this path path of intimacy. We're starting this path of intimacy. Exposing, you're exposing your heart to your perspective mate. You're you, you are, listen, after, after the, the wedding, that's not the time to spring on them a struggle that you're having. That's not the time. That's not the time. That's not the time. 
The time is the courting stage before the marriage where we can be intimate with one another. Because listen, I need you to know what's in the cup. I need to, before we walk down this, I, and listen, if I, I need to love you enough to give you the option to say, I'll take that or not. I need to love you enough to give you that option, not force it on you because I love you and I just want to be with you. If I love you enough, I'm going to tell you my struggles and allow you to decide if you want to deal with that or not. Because after them, that's way too late. That's way too late. Now, that, that is not fair to her. That is not fair to him. Because now you have bound yourself. You have allowed them to bound themselves to you. And in God's eyes, he's saying, that's it. You, 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 it's, you're in it? You're in it. That is not fair. That is not love. That is not love because you are not looking out for the welfare and the well-being of that other person. You don't love them. And I'm out of time. I'm out of time. God is faithful. God is faithful. You remember what God has said to you this morning. Remember.